My message this morning comes from Mark chapter 14, Mark 14, beginning in verse 53, all the way to the end of the chapter, verse 72. And the title of the message is The Unjust Trial of Jesus. The Unjust Trial of Jesus. And before I get into the text, I just want to kind of introduce this idea of injustice and, and what it feels like sometimes when we face injustice. As a people, I think we, I know I, am kind of naturally inclined towards justice and peace. I like both of those things. I like it when things feel fair, and I like it when things are generally calm. Uh, and so much so that when, when those times of injustice and those times of conflict come into my life, it's incredibly unsettling. Uh, it feels as though something is off, and it feels as though something is, is misplaced. And, and if the injustice is against me, or if the conflict is towards me, um, then the, the kind of sociologists tell us that the, the typical kind of response for people is to fight or flight. In other words, I'm going to fight for uh, my justice, I'm going to fight for my rights, I'm going to fight for peace, or I'm going to run away, I'm going to flight, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go the other direction and, uh, and find myself in a place where I'm trying to avoid any people or conflict because I just want to get away from it all. Have you ever faced injustice in your life? Maybe you can spend just a moment to think about that where you're gathered and think about times that maybe you've been falsely accused of something or maybe uh, there has been a, a charge against you where, where somebody brought a, a word against you or gossiped about you in a particular way and it felt unjust. Uh, it felt like it was introducing conflict into a situation where there was already peace. What's, what's your natural response? Are you, are you a fighter? Uh, do, you, do you kind of brace up and say, are you going to bring that at me, then I'm going to come at you? Or, or is your tendency more to retreat and, uh, and kind of uh, pull back from people? Uh, I know that in my heart, regardless of what happens on the outside, because I've quite honestly found myself responding both ways at various times, uh, but regardless of what is happening on the outside, I know that there's something consistent that's happening in my heart. And the consistency is this, no, that is not the truth. And I just, I, I, I want to scream it from the mountaintops and I want to make sure that people know that no, that is not true. And sometimes I do say it out loud and other times I just kind of internalize it and, and quietly kind of hold it. Well, injustice is something that, that we all kind of see and we experience in our world. And a few months ago, my family and I sat down to watch a movie that maybe you've seen as well. It's is recently um, uh, kind of brought to the to the screen, and and now it's available uh, on streaming. But it's called Just Mercy, uh, and it's a story of uh, the Equal Justice Institute and Brian Stevenson and the work that he did, particularly in the case of a man by the name of Walter McMillan. Uh, in the story, if you've not seen it, Walter McMillan is uh, is a self-employed. Um, uh, working man in Monroeville, Alabama in 1986. And there's a, a murder that happens in their town. And because the authorities were not developing any real leads or suspects in their investigation, uh, McMillan, uh, through false testimony, was accused of this murder. And the story goes on to tell about a very unjust trial uh, with false witnesses uh, and, a, and kind of a corrupt judge that that ultimately sentences this man to uh, death row. In fact, he is put on death row before a trial ever even happens, uh, amazingly enough. And then when the trial does happen, uh, it happens kind of under these false pretenses, and then he gets sent to death row. He gets convicted of life imprisonment with no parole. And the judge overrules the jury's conviction and says, not only is it going to be life imprisonment with no parole, but it's also going to be the death penalty. Well, it's at that point that Brian Stevenson and the Equal Justice Institute kind of step in and they, they hear of, of Walter's case and, and begin to go through the appeals process. And ultimately, after six years in 1993, he is not, his, his original conviction is found to be unconstitutional. And ultimately, the evidence that they're able to unearth allows them to bring a, a reversal of the verdict. And he's found innocent and released from prison in 1993. Can you imagine being in that situation? Can you imagine having that kind of an accusation brought against you? The injustice, the injustice of feeling as though you've been accused of something that you haven't done, 
and then to have to go through years of imprisonment and separation from family as a result of that? Well, I appreciate the story because it leads towards this sense of, of what does forgiveness look like? What does justice look like? What does mercy look like? And the thing that really resonated with me about the movie is that the key to Walter McMillan receiving the justice that was due to him was that it took somebody to stop and listen to his story. He had, somebody had to actually stop and listen to his story and then upon hearing his story decide, am I going to advocate for this man or am I going to leave it alone? Am I going to step into this situation and say something, or am I just going to leave it alone in its injustice? And, and I just want to tell a, a personal story about kind of the work that God is doing in my heart, even before I get into the text this morning. Over the last couple months, I've had the opportunity to get to know some local pastors here in our area and to have conversations with them, men and women, who have different backgrounds than I have. In fact, they have different theological backgrounds, they have different uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds, they have different socioeconomic backgrounds, um, but for some confluence of, of, of reason, God has saw fit to, to open up an opportunity for us to meet regularly, virtually, and to have conversation, and to pray for one another, and to get to know one another, and to hear each other's stories. And not only do we as pastors have different backgrounds, but the neighborhoods and the communities which we pastor have different backgrounds as well. And the experience of one pastor in a different location or different community than I have uh, has a sense in which they're pastoring a people who oftentimes feel this sense of injustice. Uh, it feels more present, it feels more tangible, it feels more real uh, than the injustices that I think that I face even on a daily basis. And so the, the blessing for me has been to listen to their stories because their stories and their life experiences, though they're not like mine, has been a place where friendship can grow because we've, we've been really intentional and we've taken the time to listen to one another. We've taken the time to hear one another. We've taken the time to pray for one another. And I just, I just love that. In fact, I'm, I'd say that I'm still kind of in a learning process as it relates to these brothers and sisters that the Lord has brought into my life. I, I do know this though, while I'm in the process of learning, God is doing something in me. And here's how I would best describe it. I think God is expanding my heart towards the vulnerable and the hurting in our community. And I praise him for that. I think that's a good move on God's part for me to expand my heart towards those who are vulnerable and those who are hurting. And as a result of the expansion of my heart and what I sense God is showing me, here's what I believe more deeply than I've ever believed it before. What I believe is that the answer to vulnerability and the answer to pain and the answer to injustice is Jesus Christ himself. Amen? I trust that where you're sitting, you are saying, amen, Pastor Jeff. The answer to pain, the answer to vulnerability, the answer to exploitation, the answer to injustice is Jesus Christ himself. And not just a go to your church and read your Bible kind of Jesus, but rather a Jesus who, who goes out amongst the people, who's with people, who's entering into the lives of other people and bearing one another's burden. That kind of Jesus. The kind of Jesus that makes us, compels us towards action, that makes us move in a particular direction. If I'm being 100% honest with you, Jesus for much of my life has been a comfortable place where I go to meet with him. But if Jesus is calling us, calling me, calling our church out on mission, then it means that we need to go where he leads us, to interact with the people that he brings to us, to have conversations that may be uncomfortable. And yesterday, I had the opportunity, along with some of these pastors that I'm mentioning, to join in a March for Peace in Hayward. Uh, a couple hundred of us gathered down at the Target on Hesperian, right across from Kennedy Park, and under Hayward police escort, we watched, we marched walk right down the middle of A Street. Uh, they blocked off the intersections for us. They led us kind of in a procession. There was a great partnership between the local law enforcement and those of us that wanted to march for peace 
to declare that there is something that we can hold on to. And we walked from Kennedy Hall up A Street all the way to City Hall. And the unifying rally, the unifying part of that entire march was Jesus. There was nothing political about it. It was, it was wonderful to be able to walk down A Street and to have people honking and rolling down their windows and saying, we're with you. We want peace in our community too. To be able to walk by folks that were homeless, even laying there and sitting there and they're saying, yes, we want peace in our community too. We want to see Jesus come and heal our land. And that's what we believe. We believe that Jesus does heal that he is sufficient to bring life in our brokenness, to bring life into this broken world. And so it was wonderful to be able to gather and to be able to stop then at City Hall out on the plaza and kind of distance ourselves around that plaza to sing songs, to pray, to lift up the name of Jesus. I was glad that I went. I was glad that my daughters and my wife were able to go. I was glad to see some of you out there with your families marching with us as well. And I was glad and proud to be able to stop and pray with people who i never met before and to unify our voices on a common message. Was it uncomfortable? Yeah, maybe a little bit at times, but I think I needed to get past my own personal uncomfortableness and allow just the beauty of what was happening, the, the hopefulness of what was happening, and the healing aspect of the name of Jesus just to just resonate over that place. And so I was thrilled to be able to be a part of that, and I was glad to see some of our church family out there. And I want to just say that I think that the, the Lord is moving in me and moving in us in a direction that's going to compel us to be vocal about our faith and about our dependence upon Jesus. And I trust that you'll be with me. And I, and I wish that I could hear a resounding amen coming out of the, uh, the, the, the computer right now so that, I could, um, so that I could know that you're with me. But I'm just going to trust that Redwood Chapel, we are ready and God is moving in us to take the name of Jesus, not an agenda, not a, not a political movement. Uh, not a personal opinion, not a preference, but the name of Jesus, the mighty name of Jesus to a community that desperately needs to hear him. Our world needs peace. Why don't you say that in your home? Our world needs peace. We need peace from divisions. We need peace from uh, kind of negative activities in our community. We need peace from political rhetoric. We need peace from brokenness that finds its way into our homes and into our marriages. We need relational peace. Amen? We need hope. Would you say that out loud in your home? We need hope. We have a desire for something to be better than what it is, that a financial crisis would be taken care of, that a COVID-19 would be done away with, that all the kind of challenges around employment would be settled, that there would be cycles of addiction that would be broken. Church, we need hope. Not only do we need peace and we need hope, but we need love. We need, we need to be able to embrace one another. We need to be able to advocate for one another. We need to be able to be a voice for the voiceless. We need peace. We need hope. And we need love. And the only answer, the only place to find the answer to those issues is in the name of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to say that name loudly, we're going to proclaim that name boldly, and we're going to gladly walk with those who need our voice to be able to help lift them up in their situation. Well, this idea of injustice finds its way into our text this morning because Jesus finds himself in a situation where he has now gone out from the upper room where we looked at two weeks ago, where they uh, in, enjoyed the Last Supper together. He's moved into the Garden of Gethsemane, where Pastor Sam led us last week. He's prayed with his disciples, for his disciples. He's prayed, he's asked that the Lord would remove this cup from him. And now an arrest has come as Judas has betrayed him. And now he is in handcuffs, so to speak, heading towards a trial. And it's an unjust trial. And that's where the text leads us this morning. And so I want to read for you from Mark chapter 14, uh, verses 53 through 72. You can follow along on the screen, uh, or you can just listen to my voice, or you can look at the Bible that might be in front of you. But let me read Mark 14, beginning in verse 53. It says, And they led Jesus to the high priests 
And all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together, and Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus in order to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him. He said, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. And so when the high priest stood up in the midst of them, he asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ? Are you the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated on the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. At this, the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You've heard his blasphemy. What's your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving of death. And some people began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying, Prophesy! And the guards received him with blows. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him again and began again to say to the bystanders, This man was one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear. And he said, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. As we get into this text, we're getting into a section of Mark where we're seeing these trials happen around Jesus. And these trials are, there's six of them. If you put all uh, four of the gospel accounts together, there's actually six different conversations or six different trials that happen here this evening after the Passover. It's it's got to be the middle of the night. We know that because they've just uh, celebrated the Passover feast and now they're, they're heading into this, this time of, uh, um, uh, of prayer through the evening and it says that the sun is beginning to come up. Peter's warming himself by the fire. It's definitely the middle of the night and all of these things are happening. The different trials that we see Jesus involved in here, not all in this text, but in the larger text as you put them together, he goes before Annas, who is uh, a high priest, He goes before Caiaphas, who was the current high priest, uh, the son-in-law of Annas. He goes before the Sanhedrin collectively. Those are three religious trials that he faces. And then there's three civil trials. He goes before Pilate, the Roman governor. He goes before Herod, the uh, the, the Jewish tetrarch, who's kind of been put in place by Roman uh, leadership. And then he goes back to Pilate for his final sentencing. And those three kind of civil trials follow the three religious trials at the beginning. So what we have here in this text is a story of two trials, two different men, two different trials. The two different men are Jesus and Peter, and the two different trials that they're going through have this sense of, there's a sense of there's, there's, there's uh, uh, an accusation being made, there are witnesses who are bring, being brought forth, there is a judgment who is being made, there's, there's, a, there's, there's, there's kind of a parallel thing that Mark is doing here, where he's allowing us to see how Jesus is accused, and then he's allowing us to see how Peter is accused. He's allowing us to see the innocence of Jesus, and he's allowing us to see the denial of Peter. He's allowing us to see the confidence in Jesus's response, and he's allowing us to see the brokenness in Peter. And I think that these contrasts are really important to kind of watch next to each other. Remember, the Apostle Peter is probably the key witness to the Apostle Mark, or to the writer Mark, as he writes out this gospel. And so Peter has 
the best insight to offer uh, at this story. And I'm sure that as he and Mark sat down and kind of went over the events of that night, it brought all kinds of grief back up in Peter's mind about that experience uh, that he had with Jesus as he watched Jesus be arrested, as he watched the, the trial taking place, and as his own trial was taking place out in the courtyard. And so that's the setting that we have here in verses 53 and 54. They led Jesus to the high priest, and the chief priests and elders and the scribes came together. Now, it's interesting to me that as these chief priests and elders and scribes all come together, these are exactly the same people who earlier in the week, a couple of chapters earlier, beginning in chapter 11 and in 12, when these, these tests were being brought to Jesus, these are the people who are bringing the tests. And remember, Jesus continues to speak to them and continues to show them the faulty way of thinking that they are engaged in. And we know that they are getting more and more agitated by Jesus, desiring to shut him up and ultimately to convict and kill him and remove him from the situation. And so clearly, as Judas has determined that he is going to betray Jesus, he is working uh, with these scribes, these chief priests, the high priest himself, and they have set up in the middle of the night this kind of kangaroo court to bring Jesus in against these trumped up charges. So that's what we see in verse 53. And then right next to it in verse 54, we're introduced to Peter and his scenario. And it says about Peter that Peter was following after Jesus at a distance. And he follows right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he's sitting amongst the guards, warming himself at a fire. Jesus is on trial. Peter is sitting by the fire. Uh, Jesus is under attack. Peter's following at a distance. The fact that he's there is good. The fact that he's at a distance seems to be like he should be a little bit more present in the situation. Regardless of, of where he should be, the, the, the fact is, is that these two characters are meant to be shown next to each other to see the distinction. Let's talk about Jesus' trial first, and then we'll talk a little bit about Peter's trial. Jesus' trial is found in verses 55 through 65, and uh, you can go back and kind of read through that and see how it unfolds. But there's two things that I really want to make sure that you see in this trial. The first is, is that Jesus is wrongly charged. And what I mean by that is the way in which the charges were brought to Jesus was not correct, according to Jewish law. And remember, this is the religious trial. This is the trial where he is under the judgment of the Old Testament law, ultimately. And so they should be following uh, the, 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 the construct of the Old Testament law to be doing this, this trial in a way that fits kind of the pattern that it's supposed to. Here are the various ways in which this uh, trial brings about charges that were done incorrectly. Number one, uh, this is a capital offense trial, and it's happening in the middle of the night. Um, the, the Mishnah says that these kind of trials are not allowed to happen at night. They need to be in the daytime. They need to be in public, not in private. This one was in private in the residence of the, uh, of the uh, high priest. They're not to be done on festival days. Uh, you're, you can't do these capital trials around the Jewish festivals, and we know that this is Passover. Uh, they're not to be done uh, in a way in which a, a, a verdict is made of guilty, and then the sentence is handed out in that same moment. In other words, in a capital trial under Jewish law, they had to have a day of deliberation. They, they needed to hear the case, and then they needed to pause, and they needed to deliberate on the case. And the reason for that was to remove some of the emotion of, of what I, I want to be able to say and do in this moment, and to hopefully increase mercy both towards the accused and towards the accuser to see if they could bring out a solution that did not involve ultimately a capital execution. Uh, the accused needed to have someone who was there to speak on their behalf. That's not present here. Uh, they needed to have witnesses brought against the accused who agreed in their testimony. And Mark is very clear to point out a couple of different times, these are false witnesses. They do not even agree with themselves. And, and he's writing that to help the reader see there is something wrong about this trial. Finally, the high priest was meant to be there only as a listener, 
only as an observer. His job was to cast a final vote in the event that they were at a, at a, at a stalemate. But he was not to be a questioner. He was not to be an active participant in the trial. These are all according to Mishnah or Jewish law, historical law that was written down and accumulated over time. But this would have been the rules under which this, um, this trial should have taken place. But we see that he is wrongly accused. And so we have them coming to him and, they, and, the, and the main thing that is written, it says in verse 57, some stood up. And they bore false witness against Jesus, saying, here's what we heard him say. Here's why we think he should be convicted. He said, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another that is not made with hands. Now, you may be thinking, boy, it does sound like something that Jesus might have said. But it's not exactly what Jesus said. In fact, if you go back to John 2, and you go back even earlier in this story in Mark, Jesus does declare that the temple will be destroyed. Never does he say, I'm going to destroy it, or I'm going to dismantle it brick by brick, and I'm going to, uh, to rebuild it. In fact, when he talks about it in John 2, John helps us to see that Jesus says this temple is going to be taken down, but, but it will be rebuilt in, in me. John says Jesus was talking about his own body, which would go into the ground for three days and be resurrected, that he would be the new temple, the new place where God does his mediating with man. John interprets that for us, but here Jesus's words are twisted in a way that are causing the listeners to say he's an insurrectionist. He wants to tear Israel down. He wants to tear Jerusalem down, tear our temple down. In fact, we know that it took Herod 46 years to build it. How is it even possible that he says he's going to take it apart and that he's going to build another temple? And yet it says in verse 59, even when they tried to make this testimony against him, that their words did not agree with one another. So he's wrongly charged. He's wrongly charged in the way the trial happens. He's wrongly charged in the way that the witnesses are brought. The testimonies against him don't agree. Uh, this is not a legitimate trial. That's why I called it a, a kangaroo court. It's, it's, an, it's not meant to be uh, indicative of the way that things are supposed to happen. And there are sign after sign after sign that this is not a fair trial. This is not a just trial. The other thing I want you to see is that Jesus, though he is wrongly charged, is strong and secure in his identity. He is strong and secure in his identity. Notice how what happens when the chief priest or the high priest stands up to ask him questions. Now, this high priest, remember, is Caiaphas at this time. Caiaphas, back in John 11, um, which I say back, it's not in the Gospel of Mark, but earlier in the story, after Lazarus has been raised from, raised from the dead, Caiaphas is the one who says, hey, it's going to be better for us if one man dies and takes the fall than if our whole country goes down. Caiaphas has had determined in his mind that Jesus needs to be dealt with. And so he is the ruling high priest of the moment. This high priest, the one who, according to Old Testament law, was supposed to bring a, a lamb sacrifice on behalf of the people and kill that sacrifice, kill that lamb, to atone for the sins of the people, is now standing before the Lamb of God himself, bringing a false accusation. You can just see the depravity that is all over this story. The high priest comes to him and says, what's your answer to this charge regarding the temple? What is it that these men are testifying against you? And Jesus doesn't even validate it with a response. He stands there quiet against his accusers, hearkening back to the prophecy of Isaiah that, uh, that the sheep will stand there silent in the midst of its accusation. And again, the high priest comes in verse 61 and says, are you the Christ? Are you the son of the blessed? Are you the Messiah? Let's, let's get to the heart of the issue. Jesus, you stand here quiet. You stand here quiet in the face of your, of your accusers. But let's just get to the heart of the issue. Are you the one that we're looking for? Are you the Messiah? That's what Christ means. Are you the son of the blessed? Are you, are you the son of David? Are you the promised one? Are you the one who we are anticipating? And look at Jesus' response. This is why I say he is strong and he is secure in his identity. He says, I am. 
Now, you know the power of those two words in the Jewish language. If you don't, you should know that, that the I am is the, the covenant name of God, where all the way back in Exodus, when God introduces himself to Moses, and Moses says, who should I say is sending me to Pharaoh? Say, I am is sending you. And so Jesus says, I am who you have declared. And he says, you will also see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power coming with the clouds of heaven. Now, we read that verse and we may miss the significance, but you can be sure the high priest did not. For look at what happens in verse 63. The high priest, it says, tore his garments and said, what more witness do we need? What was it that was so provocative about Jesus's words here in verse 62 that caused that reaction from the high priest? Well, Jesus' words demonstrate that he is declaring not only I am, but that ancient of days that Daniel prophesied about in Daniel 7, that judge over all the earth, that's me as well. He says, I am and you will see the Son of Man, that's the prophecy from Daniel 7, seated at the right hand of power coming with the clouds of heaven. In other words, the clouds kind of act as the chariot of God as God comes back to judge the earth. And he says, not only am I the Messiah, but I am ultimately the judge in this trial. I'm ultimately the judge over your heart. I'm ultimately the judge over all human hearts. And the high priest recognizes what Jesus is doing and he rips his clothes And he says, what other witnesses do we need? You've heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? And they sentence him to death. Well, all that is happening. There's another trial that's happening outside. And so we move to Peter's trial, which picks up in verse 66. And verse 66 to 72 shows us what is happening in the context of Peter's trial. In Peter's trial, it says, Peter was below in the courtyard. One of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, looked at him and said, you were also with the Nazarene Jesus. You see, in Peter's trial, Peter is rightly identified. In Jesus's trial, he's wrongly charged. But here in Peter's trial, he's rightly identified. And not only is he rightly identified, but but I think the contrast is meant to show he's identified not just by, uh, not by a high priest, but by a servant of the high priest. Not just by the high priest himself, but by a servant girl who is uh, working for the high priest. In, In this culture, a woman was not allowed to testify in a legitimate court setting. But here it's a girl who brings this charge against Peter. Here it's a servant girl, a servant of the high priest. It's meant to show Jesus under the high priest and here this servant girl now coming with a charge to Peter. And Peter is charged, he says, she says to him, you were also with the Nazarene Jesus. And he denies it. And he says, I don't know. I don't even understand your question. I don't even know what you mean. She says, no, 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 you, you were there. Uh, uh, and she, she begins to recognize that, that there's other people around. And, and so she, she calls them around. She says, this is this man. He's, he's one of them. And, and Peter's getting more defensive. And he's hearing the rooster crowing in the background. But he's, he's not recognizing that Jesus has just said a couple hours earlier, uh, um, you are going to deny me three times before the rooster crows twice. And, and remember back in Chapter 14, verse 30, Peter says, no, that's not going to happen. I will die before that happens. And now, just a few hours later, as the stakes have heightened, as the pressure has mounted, this accusation comes against Peter. And Peter's response is, no, 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 I I don't know him. I I, I don't even know what you're talking about. I I don't know who you are. And verse 70, after a little while, the bystanders again come to Peter. Certainly you're one of them. You're a Galilean. We can hear it in your voice. In Matthew's gospel, it says one of the reasons why they accused Peter is because he had that Galilean dialect. They knew that there was something in his voice. He's not from around here. He must be a follower of that guy. Why would he be here for any other reason? And Peter says, no, he began to invoke a curse on himself. And to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And so while Peter is rightly identified, the second thing I want you to see about Peter is that he is broken and weeping in his denial. 
He is broken and weeping in his denial. Where Jesus stood strong and secure in his identity, Peter is a broken mess. He hears that rooster crow, he remembers what Jesus said, and he recognizes that he has, in fact, denied Jesus three times, not more than an hour or two after Jesus predicted that it would happen. And he breaks down and he weeps. Do you see the contrast in these two stories? It's remarkable the way that Jesus sets it up. I want to show you just two things by way of application before we move to a time of communion and responding and taking the Lord's Supper. Application number one, Jesus knew that the Father was in control all along. So while it was an unjust trial, Jesus knew that the Father was in control. Here's the point. God is sovereign even in the injustice. God is sovereign even in the injustice. And and Jesus knew God God has this. He's got me. He knows what is going on. We know this in Mark chapter 10 when Jesus said, See, look, we're going up to Jerusalem. Here's what's going to happen. The Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death. They will deliver him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. Jesus knew what was going on. He knew that the trial was unjust, yet he knew that his father was sovereign over it all. Peter comes to that realization too, by the way, in a, in a remarkable statement in Peter's first public sermon in Acts chapter 2. We read this from, from, from Peter, Acts 2, 22 and 23. Peter says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and the foreknowledge of God. You see, Peter recognized that God had a plan and Jesus was walking according to the Father's will. Even though he had just prayed, God, if it be your will, I pray that you would take this cup from me, yet still he is willing to follow his Father's will. The definite plan, the foreknowledge of God. I recognize that Jesus is secure in the Father's sovereign hand, even in the midst of injustice. And I would say the same is true for you. Even when injustice happens in your life, God is sovereign even in that moment. And he's got you in his hands, even in that moment. And you don't need to take matters into your own hands. I'm I'm not saying you shouldn't fight for justice, that you shouldn't be a voice for justice. But even in the injustice, God is sovereign in that moment. The second thing I want you to see by way of application is that God will restore even the most blatant denial of his son. God will restore even the most blatant denial of his son. And as we move past the cross, we move past the resurrection, we move to the time when Jesus is back with his disciples up at the Sea of Galilee, we see this interaction with Jesus and Peter. And it's found in John chapter 21 and verses 15 through 19. And there Jesus is on the, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee with Peter, and they're having a conversation. And Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these things? And Peter says to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And so Jesus says to him, well, then would you feed my lambs? And then he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him again, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And so he said to him, well, then tend my sheep. And then finally, it said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And the text tells us that Peter is grieved by this question. And he says to the Lord, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus says to him again, then feed my sheep. And then it says to us in verse 19 that after saying this to Jesus, Jesus said to Peter, Now follow me. These three denials, they happened. I'm going to restore you through three affirmations of my love for you. And now I'm going to call you to follow me. And the way that I see this as an application is that there may be times in our life when we deny Jesus, we deny his power, we deny his lordship. There may be times in our life when we are silent, when we should be vocal. And when we confess those things, when we bring them to the Father and we acknowledge them and say, God, help me to be a voice 
for justice. Help me to be a voice for the innocent. God, would you open my mouth when I am inclined to run? Instead of denying you, will you help me to affirm you that God is faithful to restore even the most blatant denial of his son? And it's because of God's goodness to us in that, because of Jesus' provision to us in that, that we have the joy and the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper. And so if you have those elements with you, I want to invite you to get them. Uh, These elements can be representative of Jesus' body, which has been broken, and of Jesus' blood, which has been shed. And, and regardless of the elements that you have, that's the spirit in which I want you to think about as you take these elements. That Christ was broken for you. That his body was broken for you. That the blood of Jesus Christ was shed over you. That it was, that it was shed in a way that creates a new covenant that restores relationship with the Father. And so we're going to be led in song at this time. And as the song is being sung... I want to invite you to prepare your heart to receive the bread and the cup. I want to invite you to confess sin that may be present in your life. I want to invite you to uh, be quiet before God, to acknowledge uh, what Jesus has done for you. If there's a way in which you need to respond to this message by confessing an area where you have denied the power of God, then then do that confession now. Repent of those things now, and then with a clean relationship with God the Father, enter into this holy communion, this this uniting yourself, not only with what Jesus has done for you, but uniting yourself with your brothers and sisters and saying, we collectively sit under the broken body of Jesus and the shed blood of our Savior in unity and in, and in power, and in what we are going to accomplish in this world, we do that under the unity of what Jesus has done for us. God bless you as you have opportunity to partake of these elements, and I pray that you will uh, allow your heart to be ready to receive these things, even as this song is being played. God, we pray that 
you would give us Jesus in a very real way today? Would you help us to know the power of his resurrection and the joy of what it means to be in communion with him? Father, we love you and we thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to gather, that you've given us to pray, that you've given us to to unite even in this virtual way. And we pray, God, that we would take and hold on to the work of your Son in a powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen. Redwood family, thank you so much for joining with us today. I want to invite you to pray. Pray for our leadership of this church as we continue to meet together and to make decisions about the best way for us to connect as a church family. Would you pray for us? This, I just got to tell you that the number of decisions and the number of opinions can feel overwhelming at times. But our desire, just know that our heart's desire is to honor the Lord God with our decisions, to be consistent in shepherding our people, to be a testimony to our community, and to find unique and creative ways for us to gather together as a church. So whether that's here online, whether that's through our Zoom electives, whether that's through our time out on the patio next Sunday evening, we invite you to pray for our church family. Pray for one another. Pray for each other. Connect with one another. Reach out to each other. And let each other know that you are thinking of them and praying for them. In fact, I give you that as a charge on the way out. Find somebody else in our church family and connect with them today to tell them that you love them and that you're praying for them. God bless you. Have a great day. We hope to see you next week.